This is the last section of this chapter and I hope that you have grasped it. PV is equal to NRT was covered in high school. Maybe not so much the applications, possibly the mole fraction. I hardly think kinetic molecular theory. But what we're gonna do is talk right now about real gases. We're gonna refer back to say the ideal gas is a hypothetical gas. And the only way it can be ideal it has to conform to every assumption of kinetic theory. But real gases are going to deviate. They're going to deviate at low temperature and high pressure. But for chemistry 1210, for the most part, they're going to obey the gas laws reasonably well. But when we get to these conditions of a high pressure or a low temperature, molecules are going to be forced together and that's where we're gonna see deviations. So there is a correction factor for pressure, and there is a correction factor for volume, and that is called the Van der Waals equation. So how are we gonna look at this? Well, on the left I have pressure, on the right I have temperature. The bottom picture was the only one in your textbook for a long time, and I had a hard time dancing around this one. PV over RT versus P should give you a straight line for an ideal gas. And you look at all the common gases and you see, oh, those are really deviating. But look where they're going, between 200 and 1,000 atmospheres. We'll never see that. So finally, one of the latest additions took that part and blew it up. So you can see that near one atmosphere, which is atmospheric pressure more or less, we really don't have a deviation, okay? If we look over at temperature, again, it's PV over RT versus P, there is ideal gas. And again, who is ever gonna see these temperatures? But what it does show is as the temperature increases, it becomes more ideal. So that's really the gist currently of this section, okay? The other part you need to get an arm around is what is it like on the molecular scale? Well, we know gas molecules, they're going to attract. Chapter 11 is all about intermolecular forces. We also know that if we take a gas and turn it into a liquid, it is definitely gonna have a volume. So that's where these correction factors come from. And in the old days, you did a lab with a liquid that you turned into a gas for which you would then find the molecular weight. And all this came into play. But I guess they thought it was too hard, so it's gone. So let's talk about what we have. We have a constant called A, and it sits in that pressure term. And it really talks about the strength of molecular forces. So if we zero in on a gas molecule that is going to be hitting the wall, realize, yes, it can hit the wall, but there's also these other molecules around that are trying to have an impact on that pressure. We also have a term B that comes into the volume, and that talks about the effective volume of an actual mole of gas. So this is, I'll call it my initial, this is a pressure less than the initial pressure. And notice, we are definitely gonna have a volume of gas molecules. What has it boiled down to at this point? Well, what we have is a trend. We say that both A and B are going to increase with increasing mass. It's not linear, it's kind of case by case. But as you take your eye down this column of substances, what you will see is the A is going to increase. I'm gonna pick on helium, that's very light, and I'm gonna pick on carbon tetrachloride, that's very heavy. And you can see that definitely the A is going to increase. And again, we can't get into the specifics. If I look at B that's due to the volume, again, we have a very small number, and the number has become larger. That's about all we can say at this point with these. So what I like to do at this point is have an integrative exercise. You're almost finished with this course. What should you be able to do? Well, here it says as a material that has 46.2% carbon. I'm hoping you remember that one mole of carbon weighs 12 grams. Here we have 53.8 grams of nitrogen and one mole of nitrogen weighs 14 grams. It's gonna tell me my relative amounts of moles of carbon 
versus moles of nitrogen. And I'm hoping you're saying, I remember what to do. I divide by the smallest number. But both of these are the same. And this would be our empirical formula. So again, that comes to us all the way back from chapter three, all right? So we've got an empirical formula. Why did I want that? Well, because they want to know the molecular formula. Where am I gonna get that from? Well, notice they've given us a temperature, a pressure, and a mass, and a volume. That's screaming at us, ideal gas law. So what we would have here is we would whip out our formula for molecular weight and say we have 1.05 grams, we have 0.500 liters, that's almost the density, then we have 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, we have a temperature of 298 Kelvin, and we're gonna divide that by, ah, what are we gonna divide that by? Ooh, the pressure. 751 torr times one atmosphere is 760 torr, all right? So all of that is taught in the beginning of this chapter, and we come out with a grand number of 52 grams per mole, and that is our molecular weight. Well, we've got an empirical formula, that be 12 plus 14, 26 grams, that is our empirical weight. So what we wanna do is we wanna find our molecular formula, and to do that, we would take our molecular weight and divide it by our empirical weight. 52 divided by 26 is two, so that says we have CN taking twice, and it is C2N2. Now this is a skill set that I'm hoping that you have retained taking this course. Anyone who earns an A, you really should be fluid in this because that's what we're teaching in this course, okay? Now it says predict the structure. Well, how do we predict the structure? We did Lewis. We have two times the valence electrons of carbon, which are four, and two times the valence electrons of nitrogen, which are five, and we come up with 18 electrons. Now, again, how swift you are at this, you know, we're not gonna play that game. I am just going to write down the structure that I spent some time trying to figure out. And here I have a structure that obeys the octet rule and it uses up all electrons. It has eight around every item. We have a triple bond. This is an actual molecule. This is called cyanogen. It is extremely toxic because it has cyano groups. Now, if I were to ask you to predict the polarity, again, this is what a final exam does. It is not going to just take each individual part by section of a lecture. It is going to put all these different things together. So it looks to me like we have a very negative segment and a very negative segment, which would make this center pretty positive. So if I were to draw it in this manner, I could draw my dipole moments this way. I could ask you about the hybridization and you would say SP for both of these carbons. And what you would see is a very symmetrical molecule. And a symmetrical molecule will be nonpolar. So this integrative exercise, it uses chapter three, where we learned how to do formulas. It uses this chapter, goes back to chapter three, heads over to chapter nine. So again, as you review for the final, try to start to put all the things together.